So welcome everybody to uh, Accelerus Presents. I'm Pete Quayarello and I'm joined by Nick Totillo. And today we're going to go over some frequently asked questions about System Center Service Manager. What we wanted to do today was just to, to step through um, some questions that we've received, uh, in some cases via email leading up to this session, and in some cases just from interactions with our customers. Uh, questions that we get asked often and, and that we find most people are, are interested in. So just to confirm, what we're going to cover today is all Q&A. We normally just do Q&A at the end, but today's session is essentially all Q&A. And we'd invite anybody to feel free to add a question uh, via IM in link. Um, we may uh, we may have some time at the very end. We've got a number of questions. We may have some time to answer some other questions, so, so we'd be happy to take those if you'd like to to add one. All right, so let's get started with our first question, which is what are supported for Silverlight? And, and here we're talking about the uh, the Service Manager 2012 self service portal. So Nick, why don't you tell us what browsers are supported for Silverlight? Sure. Yeah, the question comes up a lot because um, if you look at the TechNet articles, you'll see that the only browsers that are supported for the Service Manager self-service portal are IE uh, 8, 9, and 10. And we've got uh, customers who use Chrome and Safari and Firefox and other things and are curious about whether or not the portal is going to work on those browsers. Um, so w while they're not supported officially, the self-service portal um, – in Service Manager is based on Silverlight web parts. Uh, and the version of Silverlight that it's based on is supported on IE 8, 9, and 10. Uh, it's also supported on Safari version 4 or greater, Chrome 12 or greater, and Firefox 3.6 or greater. So while it's not going to, um, you're not going to see an official support line from Microsoft for those other browsers, we, we can tell you that the the portal's going to function the way you would expect on, on browsers at these different version numbers. And, um, you know, I can tell you I've got personal experience with some of these, and there's very little difference, um, slight cosmetic differences between the two. But in terms of its function, it's uh, nearly identical. So um, so that's helpful, I think, to, to some folks who are looking to run Service Manager in an environment where they've got a lot of Mac users or something like that. Yeah, we, we seem to get this question with greater regularity, um, and, and this I know is a big consideration for some of our customers who, who don't have standard browsers. We, we uh, were talking to a university recently, and maybe not surprisingly, they anticipated having a lot of non-IE browsers. All right, great. So let's go to the next question. Yeah, so the next question we have here um, this is another one we get asked pretty frequently. Can I generate service requests via email? Um, and you guys may know that there is an exchange connector that's bundled with Service Manager, and historically that's allowed us to generate incidents via email. Um, so, Pete, would you take that question? Yeah, the answer is yes. You can generate service requests via email, and as Nick says, it would use um, an exchange connector. Uh, the exchange connector which is now officially supported uh, as of the, the latest version, which is uh, the RTM version 3.0, uh, does enable you to create either incidents or service requests. You need a, a separate exchange connector to create service requests. What we find is that most of our customers at least want to create incidents via email. If you want to create service requests as well, you'll need, as I say, a separate uh, exchange connector, which means you'll need a separate mailbox for that, and, and sometimes that that dissuades customers from doing that because they don't want to provide more than one email address to users. But in some cases, we do have customers who have uh, a very specific uh, need to create service requests via email. So if you configure an exchange connector and set the default template for a service request, you will generate a service request from inbound email to that particular mailbox. Um, there, there have been some issues um, creating service requests from email, specifically issues with the way that uh, activities contained within a service request process from a, an email-generated service request. 
Um, we haven't confirmed, but we believe those are probably fixed in this latest RTM version of the Exchange Connector. Yeah, and, and by the way, there's uh, the Service Manager version you need for the version 3.0 of the Exchange Connector is Service Manager 2012 SP1 Rollup 2, which is the latest re latest release. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, you will need the latest rollup, and you'll need to recreate your exchange connectors. So it's not a matter of upgrading an existing exchange connector. You'll need to to delete it and recreate it, which is not a big deal. And, and they've added some functionality, yeah. um, which is another reason. Okay, next question. And that question is, when is data groomed out of the CMDB? This is another one that comes up a lot. Um, we have a lot of customers who notice the data retention settings in Service Manager, but they're not exactly sure what the grooming process is. So, Nick, why don't you enlighten us? Sure. So, um, so there's three different kinds of data um, in Service Manager. Um, two of those kinds of data are in the CMDB, and then the third kind we'll call reporting data. So, in the CMDB, we have configuration items and we have work items. There's also administrative data and things like that that store your configurations, but from a functional point of view, we've got work items like incidents, problems, and changes, and configuration items like users and computers and software. Um, the grooming settings only apply to work items. Configuration item data never gets groomed automatically out of Service Manager. It can be manually deleted, but it's never automatically groomed out of Service Manager. So if a computer gets added, something like that, it will always be there un until it's manually removed. Work item data is groomed based on the data retention settings that Pete mentioned. Um, there's a, a number of days that you can set for the, the grooming time on these, and by default it's 90 days for incidents and it's 365 days for the rest of the work items. Uh, I think where people get uh, uh, confused about when this uh, applies is it 90 days or 365 days from what? So the way it works is those data retention settings apply to work items that are at a status of closed, and then those retention times are set against the last modified date. And that's an important distinction because they're not set against the closed date. So if an incident is closed today, uh, it is possible for it to stay in the CMDB for longer than 90 days if it gets edited between now and then. Now, um, that procedurally shouldn't happen once an incident is closed. It shouldn't be edited again. Um, but there, there can be times when they do get edited or workflows can run against these work items and, and increment the last modified date and therefore keep them in the system longer. So again, just to reiterate, the work items have to be closed and then the data retention time is set against the last modified date. Now once that data um, is groomed out of the CMDB, it's still available in the data warehouse. And it'll be available in the data warehouse for much longer than 90 days or 365 days. Um, so you can still get at it in your reports from a historical point of view. Um, but inside the CMDB, um, that's how the data retention settings are, are meant to work. Now, and I know that those settings can be modified via management pack, right? The, uh, the, the, the the grooming settings. Um, I I know that uh, that Microsoft has something published on that. I, I we I know we haven't had occasion to try it, but I know that that's possible. Well, the work item data retention settings. You know, you can configure right in the console. No, I'm I'm sorry. I'm not being clear. I mean, you can you can change the criteria so that instead of basing it on the last modified date, you could base it on the closed date. Oh, I see. Yes, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, and that's one of those things where it's documented but not necessarily supported. Um, but there are there are some means to, to achieve that if that's what you're looking to do. Although I'd say, I'd say in most cases, folks are generally not worried about having data too long in the database. They're generally worried about having it for long enough. So um, it, it tends to it tends to work out okay with the default settings. I think. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay, next question. All right. So the next question here is, uh, what do most people do with SLOs? Um, 
or with their uh, SLO configurations, SLOs and Service Manager being service level objectives where you can set targets against incidents and service requests. And we, we get this question asked a lot by, by folks who are, either have a very rudimentary um, service level system in place where they're really just tracking um, the resolution of incidents and, and maybe aren't focused on the priority of those incidents yet. Um, or folks who don't have any SLOs at all and are looking to start to implement those. Um, so Pete, why don't you take this question? Yeah, first of all, SLOs and Service Manager are, are time-based. Um, you're really measuring the time in between two date-time properties. And uh, so it's pretty easy to measure things like um, the time to the first assignment on an incident or a service request, the time to first response, time to resolution for an incident, time to completion for a service request. Um, most customers that we work with use a, a priority-based approach. Um, this works pretty well for incidents. A priority one incident has a target resolution of X, a priority two has a target resolution of Y, etc. Um, and as I suggest, uh, you might have targets in there for first assignment, for first response as well. Um, service requests can be a little trickier uh, because you oftentimes have greater variability in a service request. And you might have a service request with a very high priority, but it might take a while. For example, if, you've, if you have a, a service request that involves provisioning a new device and the device has to be purchased. Um, you just might not be able to turn that around in one business day or two business days. Um, so what you could do in that case is you could base the SLO, the service request, at urgency. Um, that's an easily configured list in Service Manager and, and you could potentially give yourself um, a lot of different options for urgency, uh, each equating to some sort of turnaround time, one business day, two business days, etc. What you might ideally like to do is to set service request specific SLOs. Service Manager is not really designed for that. That is technically possible, but it's probably not all that feasible. It would be a bit difficult to manage. Um, and you'd start creating a little bit of extra overhead for the application because those service requests do um, do impact performance. So you do want to maintain a, a manageable number number of service requests. But again, to, to confirm, priority-based for incident, very, very common. And then usually some combination of urgency or perhaps urgency plus priority on the service request. Great, yeah, and one of the other um, solutions we've, we've seen with this was to um, use an additional or another date property and service manager to track a due date for something. There's there's built in, there's a, a property called required by, and it's possible to set a date in there and, and just manage against that. Um, we don't love that idea because now you've got two different places to look at where something is um, where something's due. You've got the SLOs and potentially this other place, and that's that's bad from a procedural point of view, I think, but it's also just difficult to manage in the console because you can't sort on something's due date if it's split up across different properties. So it is a it is an option. It's, it's a, a potential solution, um, but it's probably not the best option in, in every case. Yeah, it's probably also worth noting we see a lot of customers evolving into SLOs, and that's a whole other topic itself. But um, you, we usually recommend, when in doubt, keep it as simple as possible and, and don't get too wrapped up in achieving the SLOs for the sake of achieving the SLOs. Try to figure out what the right SLOs are. Again, that, that's kind of another topic. Um, service level management, whether in service manager or otherwise, is uh, you know it's hard to cover in, in just a few minutes. But the, the the service level management functionality has taken a big step forward. We've talked about this in the past between the 2010 and 2012 versions of service manager, and there's a lot that you can do with the functionality in service manager 2012. So while we're on the topic of service requests, Nick. Where are the built-in service request reports? 
Yes, uh, very common question. Um, and the short answer is that there are none. Um, there are no service request reports provided out of the box uh, in Service Manager 2012. Obviously, 2012 gave us the service request work item, the new activity workflow that you could build into service requests, SLOs, a lot of things related to the process, but no reports. So um, if, you, if you ask Microsoft about um, very rightly, in 2012 was not on providing more standard reports. It was on building a new reporting infrastructure for Service Manager that would allow customers and partners to build reports in a much easier way that didn't require uh, such a specialized skill set. Um, and they did that with their OLAP-based reports. So now in Service Manager, there is an OLAP cube uh, for service requests and the service catalog. And that allows you to build your own reports in Excel using pivot tables and pivot charts based on based on this cube, which um, is going to give you the flexibility uh, in, in a lot of cases to build the kinds of reports you'll need to build. Sometimes we do need to go back to the, the way reports were done in 2010 and build uh, our reports there because you get uh, more flexibility. But the issue with the way things were done in 2010 is that it did require a special skill set. Not all of our customers were in a good position to take advantage of those technologies. So now things have gotten easier in terms of building your own custom reports. And uh, for service requests, that's something that you'll definitely have to do. Um, and if you're implementing Service Manager and thinking about using the service request functionality, uh, it'll be a, a major consideration as part of that implementation. Is what reports do we need and, and how are we going to get them built? All right, Nick, so then answer this question for me. Let's say I have um, built uh, an OLAP cube-based report, which would be done with Excel, and I've got a custom list on my service request, uh, and I'd like, obviously, to be able to include values from that list in my report. Um, so why aren't my custom list values in that OLAP cube? Yes, good question, and another very common question. Um, I mentioned just a minute ago that sometimes we have to go back to the technology that the reports in 2010 were based on, and, and this is one of the reasons why we do that. If you add a new list property to uh, a service request or an incident or anything in Service Manager, that custom list property is not going to automatically be brought into those OLAP cubes in a really readable way. You'll get the internal identifier for those list values, but not the display name in English or whatever language you're implementing Service Manager in um, so that it's readable. Um, it is possible to extend the OLAP cubes and to add uh, a new, what they call, dimension for these uh, list properties, but it's difficult. Uh, when we get back again to the, the specialized skill set, it's possible to do. It requires some custom PowerShell to be written and some custom XML to be written. Um, and, and we think one of the benefits of Service Manager, one of the real uh, differentiators for it, is that it's a Microsoft product and, and folks expect to be able to administer it on their own. And, and we like to help folks as much as possible uh, to do that. And we start to get into territory here where that's not always feasible. So. It is possible. Uh, you can extend the cubes using some PowerShell and a custom management pack. Um, but oftentimes, it's much easier and much more straightforward to get your custom list proper old uh, reporting infrastructure, which is based on SQL reporting services. Uh, and that's, that's most often what we would do to get at that kind of data. So. Um, Another question that comes up frequently related to reports here, and this one I'll pose for you, uh, propose for you, Pete, is um, how do I filter dates in OLAP cube reports? I notice that when I build reports in Excel based on OLAP cubes and I try to filter on the dates, I don't get the kind of uh, date filtering that I'd like in order to say, for instance, show me everything um, that was created last month. Yeah, this is one of the first things that people tend to notice when they start working with the cubes. To your point, they like how easy it is to get at the data 
but then they realize that some of the data is not what they expect. And the dates are probably one of the best example. And the reason for that is that those dates are not actually stored as date values. Excel does not recognize a date as a date value. It's really just a piece of text in Excel. Uh, now, that can be dealt with. And the easy answer to that is if you just have a plain ordinary date property in that OLAP cube, you can actually uh, add a, what's called a slicer in Excel, and then you can use that slicer to filter those date properties. Um, it's maybe not quite as elegant as some people would like it to be. Um, as you suggest, it's not the same as saying, give me everything before this date or after that date. It, you cannot do that in a slicer. But what you can do with a slicer is create a, a nice, easy-to-use control that will allow you to select specific dates. Now, the reason that those dates are coming across as labels is because there are a limited number of date dimensions that are provided for dates within those OLAP cubes. Those date dimensions store actual date data. Um, there are a few of them. I, I don't know them all off the top of my head, but I know that there are also some notable ones missing. Um, I think uh, the incident created date is not available out of the box as a dimension. Um, when those date dimensions exist, it's possible then to do proper date filtering. And you'll notice that you'll have an actual hierarchy of dates available. And we're getting into some Excel stuff here. But if you, uh, if you bring in a, a date dimension as, let's say, a report filter, you'll find it's very easy to select a calendar year, a calendar quarter, a calendar month, et, et cetera. Um, and now we're into the, to the idea of customizing the cubes. And um, Nick touched on that uh, in the previous question about getting list values into the cubes. Um, that would require a customization, as would adding additional date dimensions. Maybe, Nick, you could just take a, a second and touch on that. Yeah, what we'll do, there's a really good blog post that explains how to do this, and we'll link that in the description of the YouTube video for the session uh, when we publish it. Um, but it's a similar process. There's a custom management pack that you have to that you have to create and then import in the XML. That blog post has an example for the incident created date that you can use. Um, and then there's a bit of PowerShell that needs to get written. Uh, but again, that, that blog post has... Uh, the sample PowerShell for getting the incident created date in. So you can use that as kind of a template to go and, and add the rest of the date dimensions that you might need to add. So not very straightforward, um, again, but it is possible to do to get these in, and it's critical. I mean, about the first thing, you know, about the first report you might want to run when you're live with Service Manager, show me all the incidents that were created last month. And, and without going through this process, uh, it's impossible to do that with the OLAP cube reports. Um, again, like I mentioned before, with the um, the old SSRS based reports, it's it's a bit more straightforward to do so. Yeah, and again, and the slicers give you a, a workaround there, but you know they, they take a bit more manual intervention. And, and as I said, we're getting to some extent into some some uh, Excel functionality, obviously going away from Service Manager. But that's also one of the one of the value adds when you have these cubes is that, as Nick had mentioned earlier, you don't really need a specialized skill set for the most part, to build reports uh, in Excel. And with Excel services now in SharePoint, um, it makes it very, very easy to publish these Excel-based reports. So they're, they're highly desirable. Uh, but obviously, you have to get the right data into them. All right, so we, we've got a couple more minutes left. We've got a couple more questions that we got um, to, to answer on the session before. But I just wanted to give uh, folks an opportunity, if you've got a question, you know, go ahead and type it into the chat, and, and we'll answer that. Uh, any of your questions. Um, uh, but in the meantime, I'll go ahead with with the next that we received ahead of time. Let's see. Oh, it looks like we do have a question here. So I'll read it. Uh, it says, um, "I'm building request offerings for a self-service portal that includes simple lists with 45 or more list items in some cases." Um, right on TechNet, they're creating. Uh, management pack enumeration list could be a good way to manage these lists rather than the simple list I have to maintain per request offering. Do you know of a good tutorial on creating custom MP enum lists? 
Um, we do. Yeah, I can I can forward you some information on on how to do that. It's it's very straightforward. Um, you can use the authoring tool. Um, it would probably take about five minutes um, to build the management pack that would add the list. And what you would do is you'd seal that management pack and import it into Service Manager. And then you can manage the values right under the library workspace, just like you do with the rest of the list properties. It's seamless. Um, to Service Manager, it doesn't care that it's custom or provided out of the box, and, and you can manage them that way. Um, and that's a good point, especially if you're going to use the list value, uh, the list values in more than one request offering. Then it's really a good idea, because then you can manage it in a central location. Um, instead of, you know, if you add or change a value in one list, you got to remember to go to others, and you wouldn't have to do that with the management pack list. So I'll make sure that we get that uh, that link out to you. Okay, so I'll go on to the next question. Um, and this one will be for you, Pete. Um, and in the interest of time, we'll uh, probably go into a little less detail with this one than, than we could, because there's quite a lot that you can easily configure in the self-service portal. But Pete, what can I easily configure in the Service Manager self-service portal? Yeah, this this is a potentially big question. I'll, I'll just I'll try to keep it as brief as possible. Um, I think anybody who's had some exposure to the self-service portal and Service Manager recognizes that it's it's intended to be managed largely via the UI via the Service Manager console. Um, you've got um, uh, within the library workspace, you've got a service catalog node which allows you to create and edit both service offerings and request offerings. So you could you can create and manage a lot of content there. And as you had met, met, mentioned earlier, Nick, um, you've got these web parts in the portal, these Silverlight web parts which basically take the content that you've created and presented. Um, and that's really a lot of what our customers tend to ask about is, what can I do with those web parts? Um, there are some things that you can do with the web parts. Um, there are some things that you can either hide or make visible uh, within the web part settings. Um, you can change the look and the feel of the web parts. You can do that on a web part by web part basis. Um, there is a way via uh, a configuration file to do some global changes to the web parts. Uh, we're talking about things like font colors, font size, um, you know, mostly aesthetics or look and feel. Um, if you wanted to get into making significant changes to the, to the data that the web parts display, you actually have to build your own web parts. You cannot edit the built-in web parts, but I believe they do give you base web parts um, that you could use as the basis for your own custom web parts. And we haven't found a lot of customers who've wanted to do that, but it is possible to do that. The other thing that you can do, we've done this for some customers, is we have bypassed the built-in service catalog and service offering web parts, and we've built, using SharePoint Designer, custom home pages. Uh, which effectively replace that service catalog web part, which is the, the default home page. And what that allows you to do then is it allows you to do a couple of things. Number one, you can have any look and feel you want. You could make the home page of the portal look a lot more like other SharePoint sites that you might have uh, already deployed. And you can link directly to the request offerings which is something that uh, a lot of our customers want to do. They want to have as few clicks as possible. Um, so that allows you to click right into a request offering. And another, just a kind of a related question we get, um, do I have to use that landing page in the request offering web part because it seems like it just introduces an extra click? And the answer is yes. Unfortunately, that web part, as I mentioned, can't really be reconfigured without being rebuilt, and that landing page is that landing page. So the, the custom home page helps um, to reduce the number of clicks. And as Nick mentioned, we, we could probably do a, a, a webinar, and maybe we will in the future do a webinar on the, on the portal itself and, and some things that you can do with, with portal configuration. Um, but that's kind of, a, kind of a very quick summary of what you can and can't do in the portal. Great. Yeah, thank you, Pete. Yeah, I think the um, creating your own HTML homepage is, is something that's that's 
fairly popular for our customers, and it's easy enough to do. It doesn't require a lot of special knowledge, and um, it can it can improve the look and feel uh, and the navigation through the through the portal to make it quicker for folks to get to what they're looking for. So um, we're just about out of time. We had a few more questions, but um, I think what we may want to do is um, do another round uh, of these FAQ sessions at a later date and, and gather more questions from folks and um, and go through them again. So, um, Yeah, that's a good idea. I would say if there are any other questions, feel free to add them to the IM window. And if not, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll schedule a follow-up session and we'll try to get to some of the questions that we didn't get to today. And then we can also take some questions in the session as well. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, all.